Welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. I'm Ross Carl here on Rugby Pass and Sky Sport. And boy, do we have a big weekend of rugby that we've just been through. A few questions to answer once again. Geordie Barrett, is he a shoe in at 15? What on earth happened to the Blues on the weekend? What is a shift drive? And are the Chiefs now a chance here? Joining me, James Parsons in Auckland and down in Christchurch, Bryn Hall. Thanks for coming on board, fellas, as usual. Now, I know it's been a tough weekend for you. <laughs> Jipper. <laughs> um, hasn't been a tough weekend for Bryn. He's been swanning off playing golf. But what did you make of those blues? Uh, oh, just, I suppose, to be fair, for both sides of that game, just first half inaccuracies. Like, both sides created a hell of a lot. Uh, you know, there was line breaks and it was just, you know, I suppose those inaccuracies, one at set piece, but I suppose the offloads going to ground, um, you know, even on set plays, you know, passes, um, you know, not going to hand. Um, so I, it was, I suppose that turnover ball um, was pretty high. Uh, so there was a lot created. Um, it was exciting uh, to watch, but not a lot finished. And then went down to the wire and, you know, you know, you know sometimes they say uh, winning ugly is, is effective. And I, and I thought we were going to manage to do that. And uh, then a bit of brilliance by the Chiefs at the end. And, uh, you know, they've, they're always known to be fighters. Uh, they've based themselves around that Chiefs manner for a long time. And they certainly lived up to that again uh, on the weekend. And it's always a tough place to go and uh, do the business in Hamilton. And uh, they got the spoils at the end in uh, the 79th minute or 80th minute. Yeah, a couple of straight wins for them against teams they probably weren't expected to beat. Uh, Brad Webber post-game was incredibly confident. He said, we expected to win that game. And he, especially as they were going through some troubles through the game. Bryn, that's what you expect from the Chiefs, is it? It's that kind of mindset. Through a few seasons now, with injuries and everything that's going on, they somehow manage to pull their head above the water. Yeah, they do. You obviously, you obviously take away last season's, um, obviously not winning any games, but traditionally, yeah, they're fighters and they always find a way. Um, there was a team to get um, pretty hard to go against. I think we've lost twice to them. I think one that sticks in my mind is that game in Fiji. We actually were up by 28 points in Fiji, and then they end up coming back, um, showing a bit of resilience, and we've talked around that Chiefs winner that they have. Um, you know, it's one and truly back now. Two games on the win, um, winning games late, um, especially against the Blues side that we talked about last week. Um, thought we'd make the adjustments after playing us last year and losing, and then coming back and having that fixture next game and um, trying to get those learnings from that but I guess just on that the biggest thing that I was impressed with the Chiefs um, a lot of it was talked around at the start of the week was the set piece and especially at the scrum time look I thought the, the Chiefs scrum was, was outstanding it's probably the best performance that they've put in collectively as a group um, you know they the Blues brought on the two props at, at half time and to try and set a bit of dominance and you know they held their own and you know, for me that was probably the biggest part around that they didn't get the parity that the Blues were probably looking for at the start of the week and then um, I think you yeah, we'll probably talk around this podcast around the Blues not getting the points that they deserve when they were inside that half. Um, there's been a lot of talk around the penalties, around not taking them, but again, when you've got a set piece that probably hasn't gone as well, talking about the Chiefs now, they haven't actually um, played that, well, not played that well, but haven't had that ascendancy. Um, I thought they were massive this weekend. Um, I think Neil Barnes talked around at half time that um, there's a big focus for them in the weekend. Um, for me personally, that set piece battle, and especially at scrum time, I think the Chiefs were outstanding this weekend. They just went. We saw more good stuff from Damien McKenzie, Bryn. He is looking sharp. Yeah, he is, mate. He's in he's in top form, isn't he? And um, we've talked about it before around whether he's going to be at 10 or 15, but I guess what they're doing, they're persisting at the moment and getting a real, uh, that real junior team with Trask, whether that will be with Brent in the future, having them start the game. And then we've talked about it a lot around um, bringing him in that last 20, 25 minutes when teams are tired, um, reserves are coming on, and the game's a little bit more, more open, and you know, he, can, he can bring in his... his his counter-attack game, he can rove around and he can pop up in spaces like he did on the weekend just with that try with Luke Jacobson uh, being in and around the ball. So, yeah, look, we've got some good fullbacks at the moment. You know, we haven't even talked about Jordy who scored 30 points on the weekend, so no doubt, no doubt we'll get to that. But, um, yeah, I'd like to see him probably stick with that, keep Damon at 15 and then uh, bring him in for, um, into 10 for probably that last 20, 25 minutes and when the game's really open, he can immerse himself in, in that running rugby. Well, let's get straight into it. You've got two incredibly informed 15s at the moment. Geordie Barrett scoring 30 points by himself. You've got Damien McKenzie looking really good and Bowden Barrett's not here. What happens? What, who do you select for the All Blacks at 15? Uh, we've, I've been a Damo fan for a long time. I think everyone knows that. But I think Geordie's probably got the inside running due to last year's form at 15. 
um, and he he's probably you know been in that wing spot and due to his brother being there so he's now backing it up so he's probably got the first right of way and then you know obviously Damo's can maybe pick up that bench spot and you know if he goes down he'll he'll be next in, in line but that's the the beauty of that depth but that's the only theory I can go with is the fact that is it's that you know last year's form has now been carried on yeah um, and you know that's that's how they normally work is it's just been a continuation of of that form is you can't ignore and and man he's in touch and he's he's made a statement and he's like I don't want to play anywhere else and, and, and especially at such a crucial time where Jackson Garden Backship has gone down, it would have been so easy to put him in at 10 for those Hurricanes coaches. And he obviously stood pretty strong to say, no, I can do my best footy from 15. And I thought Auburn Ledger was much better at 10 this week. He, he looked really comfortable and, and, and behind a much more dominant uh, pack. I thought Scott Scrafton made a big difference for them as well. Um, but yeah. I mean, that's by the by, sorry. Yeah. Um, but I, I think uh, they look a lot more organised this week and, and Geordie's performance was on the back of a lot of other people doing their jobs really well as well. Yeah, including the coaches. Uh, I'm not sure if you, you looked at these, Bryn. The way that they scored those first two tries, they were creative plays that put Geordie Barrett into position to, to score the tries. Yeah, they were. They were nice sort of little changes in their face by attack. I think we've talked it around um, previously, last time around, and getting into that kind of um, centre and and winger kind of on the outside edge, but they must have seen us in the preview around the Holl around the Hollanders, around how they did that defensively. Um, just and then coming back, you know, I think traditionally you've seen some guys usually a team might get the ball on quick ball, step back, and then give it in the inside to the into that kind of rover coming inside. But what I like liked about it is they had the three forwards, and then they they hit the pivot out the back, and then it was a, it was a cut off there, which is something that you haven't I haven't seen before, and so. It probably goes full credit to their, their attacking staff seeing the pitches and bringing actually something quite new that um, I haven't seen and probably New Zealand teams haven't haven't faced. So um, it was really good. They scored twice off that. Um, and so no doubt the Hollanders will probably want to be doing a bit more defence around that. But again, you've got to give hits off around the, the plan they had. They, they definitely saw it as a plan and you know, they got the rewards of it having two tries in the game. Well, we're seeing lots of looks, like I suppose we're seeing lots of different kinds of attack from the Hurricanes over the last couple of weeks. And that, does that make it difficult for the opposition defence to, to plan as it goes on, knowing they've got so many options there? I think it doesn't make it difficult in, certain, in terms of plan, but it, it means that you've just got to be really organised and got to be able to stay on. And I suppose that's what Bryn's getting at is they obviously saw something in the Highlanders' defence that maybe they button off on the inside once the ball's gone past those defenders. And so once they've gone into those forwards and, and maybe they're looking to fold, you know, they're looking for their next job. They're looking to really get around that corner to make sure that they set early for their next task to get up and bring that line speed. So because they're looking to do that next job, that if they can go out the back to Geordie Barrett as it was on the weekend and he steps back in and, and can give that pass back in or it's Nani gives it back into Geordie like the second try, then, you know, that's that space created. So... Um, because they're so eager to get to the next job, they've, they've seen it's not a lazy thing, it's almost you're so keen and, and, and the Highlanders are so eager to get to their next job that they're, they're not just... So, you know, for the Blues this week, it's almost finish that first job first. Once that tackle's been made of whether that forward pot of the Canes carries or they go out the back and they make, you know, they go out the back and they do their thing, which they've shown really well as well as in the Hurricanes out here. Once the tackle's been done, You've cleaned your area, then go to your next job as fast as you can. Don't leave and try and, I suppose, predict that it's just going to happen because they're starting to show that they can pick you apart if you think you're, you're one step ahead of them sort of thing. So it, it doesn't mean you're going to have to try and outthink them. You've just got to be organised together in your D-line with your mates and be a wall. For that try, you know, there was 15, 16 phases that had been built around that. So with tiring defences and, you know, as you know, it's... It's hard to stay on for you know 15, 16 multiple phases to be able to get your defense right. And so, coming back to that attacking, you know, you look at that um, when Jordan scored his try, they've actually seen up and had a look at the pitches. So obviously it was a plan that they had them in the game, but you know that kind of 14th, 15th phase when they did score that try, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so hard for tiring defenses when you're defending that kind of multiple mm -hmm. phases. So, um, again, I just alluded to it before with the attacking shape. You know, you talk around giving a big pat on the back for previewing around um, for the coaches. I think whoever the attacking coach for the for the Hurricanes was um, deserves definitely a pat on the back for that display on the weekend with yeah. that variety. 
It was superb. It was really superb. I suppose one of the things that the Blues didn't do very well is when they got into those areas and manipulate the space quite like that, did they? They seemed to get down that end and, and not quite do it right against the Chiefs. Well, I think it's Bryn's point there is, is maybe the patience is the key. You know, it's OK that if, if it does take 21 phases, 22, just have that patience and be prepared to build those phases. It doesn't have to take, you know, two or three phases, um, you know, roll your sleeves up. But I think, you know, what the Blues will be looking to get back to this, this week and when it works so well for them is just keeping it simple. Carry hard, clean hard, quick ball, keeping it simple, get to the edge, carry hard, clean hard. You know, that, that's when they look their best. And, you know, the balls aren't going behind, you know, that those catch pass skills are just, you know, crisp. And that Highlanders blueprint, you know, like when we were talking about their decision makers were making the best calls of whether it's the overpass or they're running flat to the line looking to offload. Um, you know, we're talking about the forwards just running hard and cleaning past the ball, getting that defensive, that clean so deep that the defensive line have to take another half a step, which buys you your playmakers another you know few seconds it, all those sort of things are just the simple basic footy that we know that they're capable of and that they know that they're capable of and and i have no doubt that the coaching staff will just go back to that simple basic blueprint and uh, they'll bounce back this week uh, for sure and when you look at the way this competition is stacking up with the teams getting in behind the Blues <laughs> oh, now. Suddenly no. the second place competition seems very open. I said last week, I was like, oh, I hope everyone gets in behind the comp, you know. Like last week I was like, you know, it's, it's well now we've got a real fight for second. Yeah. But, you know, we're talking about the Chiefs going for second. Or well, the Canes are right on it now. You know, they could, they, they're hot. Like they, they've, what the shifts they've made in their phase play D since they played the Crusaders, like Corey Jane needs a pat on the back because we mentioned their phase play D after the Crusaders and, and obviously Cody Taylor's um, run up the middle as an example. Some guys were in drift defence, other guys were in rush defence and that created the hole. Well, I, I mentioned it last week in the Chiefs game, like the, the phase play D, like all the, the Chiefs comeback tries were sort of from scattered D, but their phase play D was rock solid. When they were in hold and push from a midfield ruck, they really utilised the sideline. When they were in rush, they were all connected and they were in rush. Man, it was the same. And, and you know, people were like, oh, the Highlanders couldn't break through in the 22. Well, I want to flip it on the flip side and, and just give some credit to the Hurricanes' defence. You know, the, the Crusaders get the pump up when they hold out teams in 22s. But whenever it's any other team, it's, oh, why could, what, what's wrong with their attack? Why can't we give the Hurricanes' D a pump up? You know, Duplessis Karifi was just throwing his body around everywhere. Colsey was into everything. Um, Adi Savia, Scott Scrafton coming back from an injury was just like in the thick of it. Tyrell Lomax set the tone early. You know, there, there was some desperation. When uh, Vahakolo was going for that corner, I think there was four Hurricanes jerseys in the picture stopping him so he couldn't reach out and go for the try. So the, the work that they've put in since the bye to sort their phase play D out has been exceptional. And when they rush, they're rushing together and they're just committed. You know, if you're looking around the Highlanders, you know, they had 75% territory, and, oh, sorry, uh, position and 65% territory, you know. So I think, and especially with the Highlanders, they offer so much around their attack, their attack shape, especially with Nuggies there. You know, there were a lot of times where they had quick ball, um, they had different of off, off Aaron, they were hitting out the back with Hunty and Josh Ruani, who I thought was actually fantastic at 15. I thought it was really... Um, is really good at attacking, attacking wise, but yeah, you've got to commend their defense because you know the Highlanders offer a lot of a lot of headaches, especially with their face play attack and how, and how many options they have. And they're yeah, coming back to your point, there are a lot of guys that still up around that defensive end. You talk around big moments, and you talk around their, um, that uh, that Zavano, what's his name, the, the winger? By how do you pronounce it properly? Fahakolo. Yeah. Fahakolo. Sorry. Yeah. When they all came to, sh to, to shut that off. That kind of just shows what, what your defense is all about when you've got individuals like that chasing to try and to try and get that and save that try. So, yeah, the Corey Corey Jones definitely deserves a pat on the back because I thought the, the Hurricanes, their defense and how connected they were and some brutal brutal contests that they had, um, especially with the Highlanders who gave them a lot. They played a lot of rugby and they just couldn't really break them until the back end of the, the game when they were actually have quick taps with Bucketarve and Aaron Smith getting in behind them um, around you know off, off the cuff like that. I like that you just mentioned Fakatawa because I reckon his performance off the bench justifies him staying at the Highlanders. He's a mini Smith. Mm. Thomas Umanga Jensen's try is just Aaron Smith. And I think that's his best progression into the All Blacks. 
because you know you look at um, Aaron Smith, and I know the Highlanders didn't have the night that deserved, but I thought Aaron Smith was great. You know, Frizzell's non-try unfortunately knocked it on, but that was from a quick tap, and him. If you watch that segment of play, he is just roaring at his forwards. He's orchestrating the whole thing to create that try. And then the same uh, for when Connor Garden Bashit scores. He it's a quick tap, and then Joshuani was great. Uh, it was a great cutout ball that that set up Connor Garden Bashit. That was Aaron Smith at his best, and and I thought he was great on night. And congratulations to him on, on what's mm. a fantastic achievement. But then when Fakatava came on, it, it didn't. Nothing changed. Do you know what I mean? Like, and he's just sitting at training, and he's just getting this apprenticeship. And, and you almost saw it in the Magpies last year, but like, just that moment, how quick he was! It was a free kick at the scrum, boom, quick tap, straight out to Umanga Jensen, and before the Canes could react, it's try. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it just justifies his decision to stay down there, although he might be wearing 21 for a long time, and he might get the odd start. It, it'll be the best apprenticeship into his international career, in my opinion. And we've seen time and again, players coming off the bench can make the All Blacks out of bench roles. Well, yeah. We've seen it a number of times, especially in red jerseys. He's <laughs> <laughs> been a few given away, but with his natural skill set, Bryn, added to an Aaron Smith apprenticeship, this guy's basically unstoppable. Yeah, he is, mate. He's in, he's in a rich band of form, and I think he's just taken so much confidence from that Hawks, Hawks Bay uh, campaign. And um, we've said a lot on this podcast, especially as an inside back, you know, time in the set is crucial. And you know, I think that one of the biggest thing that I enjoyed at his, his Mighty 10 Cup was just his game manager. We've always known that he's he's electric, um, he's got X factor, but he's actually in a lot of his in a lot of his games for Hawks Bay, his game management and making the right decisions at the right time was was the biggest improvement that I saw with him in that Hawks Bay campaign. And like you said, he's been learning under Nuggy for, for almost two years now. Uh, he's going to be down there for a couple more years. But now his transition is going into Super Rugby, whereas I think last year it was a little bit erratic around um, decision-making. Is it the right time to take quick tabs? Is it the right time to run? Is it the right time to pass or kick? But whereas now I think the confidence that he got in that Hawks Bay campaign, the game management, the time in the, time in the saddle, it's just flowing into, flowing into the Super Rugby campaign. And I think the biggest thing, Especially in Super Rugby, Aotearoa, and successful teams, um, is having that having that one-two punch. And you don't lose anything with Aaron. Look, Aaron's probably he's the best in the world as a halfback, and you know he's probably top two in the world. If you can bring someone on that can replicate that in the same style, uh, and if anything, he's probably actually more with his with his footwork and actually with the ball on hand. So we talk around Damo, around him under the tiring defences. Um, you're bringing on Fakatava, who's just electric and been able to bring. Um, those tiring props or a tiring lock, they're tired and it's 50 or 60 a minute and a guy like that is just going to come on and bring that kind of energy and something different. Um, yeah, look, it's going to be a great one-two punch for those guys, not just this year, but uh, moving forward for the next couple of years with the Islands. They're not going to get any impact off the bench from Liam Squire for the rest of the season. He's out. No, oh, yeah, it's, that, it's gutting. Uh, is that a huge loss for them, considering they haven't played much of them so far this year? Oh, I think it, I think any one of his experiences is a, is a huge loss, but the beauty of that is, uh, they're going to be around the squad. You, you don't lose that experience in and around the group. And I think sometimes players like that almost become like a coach, don't they? You know, they, they add to the group in, in other ways and, and no doubt he'll be doing that. And he came back determined to add to the Highlanders and make shifts. And he has a, I think he has a pretty good relationship with Tony Brown. So I have no doubt, if, although he can't do it on the grass, he'll be doing it else, elsewhere. Yeah, Kazuki Himeno is the guy who's going to be taking his role. I wrote on my notes, how good is Himeno? Yeah. Himeno, sorry. Um, I, I just thought the energy. And, and he was just, every chance he got if there was a break, he's looking to high-five anyone. At one stage, I thought he was about to high-five the ref. He was just into everything. Got a good turnover, he's strong carries, leg drive. Um, he's, he's certainly um, giving a lot of impact off the bench. He's, I, I, I don't think... He, look, he might get a start, I don't know, but I think he, he's a great impact. He, he's certainly going to bring a lot of energy, and um, I thought Frizzell was exceptional, um, all apart from, obviously, the knock-on, but uh, he was a beast. And that, that, the, the six jersey is just people are lining up, um, but he was, he was immense, um, you know, defensively carrying, uh, line-out work, scrum work, more work. He was he was into everything for Zell and um, Rino Michele too as well. So, uh, look, I, I think he is probably more suited to a, to a bench role at this stage. Mm. 
but he was great. Like, I enjoyed watching him. He was infectious to watch. I don't know what you thought, Bren, but he, he certainly, um, you didn't miss him on camera. You've got a loose ball trio at the Highlanders, I think, uh, is performing, pre- uh, performing pretty well. Uh, Marina's playing well. Shannon was immense on the weekend, and you've obviously got Lynchies and, and Billy Harmon will be going in with that, that seven roll. So, um, and I think as the games get tighter and the depth of your squad, having that impact of the people, we talked about it with Fakatawa, around his impact and being able to bring that on. There's nothing better when you could bring on, bring on a player like that when you can have high energy, but actually being using that energy um, really, really well. And look, I thought he was fantastic on the weekend. And um, again, he'll get more used to on the Highlanders style and, and base play and understanding what that is to play like the Highlanders. But yeah, again, for a debut for someone that um, hasn't been in New Zealand rugby and playing in a Super Rugby Aotearoa difference, um, yeah, I think he was, he, was, he was great for the Highlanders on the weekend. You mentioned Frizzell and how good he is. There was a debate in the office this morning. I had the same debate with uh, Joey Wheeler on Twitter uh, when he came after me. As you know, I am a signed up member, in fact, possibly the president of the Lou Jacobson fan club. And he has been immense for a couple of weeks. The All Blacks number six jersey. I know Jacobson's been playing at eight, but really the hole is at six, isn't it? Because Artie's going to be at eight. So, you know, what do we do here? Frizzell, Jacobson, Akira Ioane, Tom Robertson lurking probably a little bit further back in the background. Where do we go? You can start, Jeff. Blackadder. Oh. <laughs> and Ethan Blackadder. You'd, you'd have to say Akira and uh, Shannon are the inside runners. Yeah. After last year and the way things finished up, you'd have to think they've got, you know, they're, they're backing up with form and, and the current in the current, I thought you were shaking your head there for a second, Bryn. I was about to light you up. Um, <laughs> I was like, hold on a minute, here we go. Um, but I, I think so. I think those two uh, are the front runners, and it'll be on what team they're playing and what style they want to play. Uh, I think they've got strengths to either parts of their game. I, I really think Akira came into his own, and I think he's got the ability to go to both both styles a little bit easier. He's obviously great in the wide channel, as we know, but he's grown that, that tougher edge into his game. Um, and, and I've obviously just spoken about Shannon. He, he does bring that harder test match level edge and, and he is getting more and more um, of that physical prowess about him and maybe just needs to probably that, that wider ball running channel game that the All Blacks like out of, out of their six as well. Um, Luke Jacobson, I like him at eight. Honestly, I don't think it's as easy to say um, eights, you know, like Artie's there. Um, I think Hoskins has got to be in that conversation. I think Luke Jacobson has to be in that conversation. I- I'd like to put Dalton Papali in a conversation of a bench spot because he can cover six, seven and eight. I think he was just a freak on the weekend, you know, 21 tackles, four turnovers, uh, one line-out steal. You know, sometimes you can forget that Dalton's a genuine line-out option. He's a, he's a power athlete. Um, you know, he's explosive, so he can play a six and an eight role in that line-out space. He can play that seven role because he's great over the ball. Um, six carries for, you know, 36-odd metres. So I know I'm trending down a blues line here, I know. <laughs> but, um, so there, there is great depth, but I, I do think the incumbents of the performances they put in the jersey will have the first run, and if they nail it and take it, they'll hold it. And then maybe games will, if they can get out and secure trophies, then opportunities will present themselves in that jersey. But you don't just get given runs in that jersey. You, you really have to earn them. Come back to your point on Dalton, mate. I think the bigger you've given on, obviously, your stats. But, mate, he is just, what I love about Dalton, he's just he's just a big-time player, man. Like, there's big-time moments in games where, if you're talking about influencing games, and you obviously talked around the four turnovers, but it's the timing of those turnovers when he's when he's wanting them, Jip, that I just find that it's, it's that impressive. Like, you we talked around, like obviously, Sam Kane's been doing it for years and captain of the All Blacks, but the thing I just love about Dalton is just his time and his, his big-time plays of when he can influence games. And so you're giving out the stats around there, you know, 20 tackles, four turnovers, four turnovers, which is impressive um, in any in any game. But the thing I love about Dalton at the moment is just his ability to have those big, Im- impactful moments um, time and time again. Mate, and he's got no fear as well like he'll he'll go for the big play and I think that's what all great players will do you know like they will always go for the big play there's no fear of that giving the penalty away and maybe you know he he will he he wants to be that man in the arena you know sort of like Richie Mwanga goes you know I walk towards that pressure I want Dalton's of that vein Mm. he he wants that pressure he wants the big occasion he wants that moment and he wants to be the guy to do it 
And I think, you know, sometimes he can be a little bit forgotten about because he wears a seven in the Blues team, but he can play other roles. And I think sometimes when you wear the seven in super teams, it's just because the skippers, All Black skippers in the seven, you can fall and be forgotten. Mm. Um, as, you know, poor Artie's found out as well. And I suppose that's why he plays a little bit more at eight. Um, but, yeah, I just think Dalton just needs, needs to be remembered, especially in a bench role maybe. Maybe not starting because there's other guys that have been waiting their time and, and deserve, but he, he can play a great bench role because of his versatility. It, it is a difficult situation, though. I suppose we talked about this last season because it's pretty much exactly the same. When you have Artie, who's, you know, probably... Un, you can't not select Artie. You can't oh, not no. select the captain. No. You're left with a bench option and a six option, and you've got to figure out how you work in and around that, and especially with a guy like Hoskins, who, you know, he could come on and, and play off the back of the scrum at eight, but maybe play another role within the game as well. Jeez, it's just hard to know where to go. Uh, well, it's a nice nice option to have. Mm. Um, I think it's I think it's good, and it, it brings the best out of it for Super Rugby Aotearoa, doesn't it? Because everyone knows this, you know, and then you've got to play your best footy week in, week out to get in the squad, and then, you know, you've got your hands full to get into the team. I, I don't think it's a bad thing. And, and yeah. you know, I, I, don't, I you know, you think about someone like Luke Jacobson. I, he really wants to get back in that black jersey, and, and in a team that was considered struggling, his performances and desire to get back in there has led to them being better and better each week and giving them the opportunity to turn it around, and now they're in a discussion of making a final. Mm. He brings that hard edge that I really like, both on attack and defence. There's something really tough about that guy. Well, I think, it, I mean, Bryn just said Dalton plays big. I think he's the same, you know. He's, he's when he hits, you stay hit sort of thing, you know. And, and when he carries, he, he carries through the contact and, and gets those post-contact metres, as they like to say. You know, it's all well and good getting these running metres, but how many metres do you actually get after contact is, is a true measure of, of someone's carry. You know, like an Artie, I think he's probably the best at, at post-contact metres than anyone, but... Um, you, know, you know, Luke, Luke Jacobson's right up there as well. And, you know, we saw the other night, he's got a good turn of pace. Yeah, I think one guy that impressed me as well was actually Quinta Pye. You know, where there was a lot of hype with him last year and he had such a great minor 10 cup and then probably got a little bit, I wouldn't say underdone, but maybe just a really teething process around what it was for that jump up at Super Rugby. But I think him being at 12 has been a, has been a massive difference around that. And I think it's been um, a big, um, it's been a great combination with him and Anton pushing out to 13 because... I think with 13, there's a lot more animation around decision making, around where you have to, who you have to get to, and what's in front of you. Whereas 12 is a little bit tighter, and so defensively, you know, he made 12 tackles in the weekend, but you know they're good, solid tackles and they're dominant tackles. Um, but as attacking powers that he's actually brought in, we saw a lot of that in his first year, and kept cup breaking, uh, making massive line breaks. He actually talked about it in his, his post match around. He's actually been used to him making line breaks in Super Rugby, and it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of foreign to him because he just hasn't been used to it. So. I think his progression, his, his combination with Anton, um, it's definitely one to watch. Definitely one to watch moving forward. Mm. Uh, I hate to go back to this, and I hate to give this guy props because he'll never hear the end of it. He listens to this show. Um, his name is Marcus Kennedy. You guys both know him. He works behind the scenes at Sky. He's the guy behind that Zoom camera that comes in from the drone that picks up the forward passes. Ah. So this year we've gone from having a wide angle to being able to zoom right in. So when it's floating up high above, we can get in and see those angles slightly better. So he's so the master. Marcus Kennedy's brought in the new ah, tech. And boom, well, well done, Marcus. Forward tries. Well, yeah, well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forward passes are now being called right. Yeah, well. You know, that's power. That's, that's serious power. <laughs> that's if only power. it could have been this yeah. coming week and we missed last week and the Blues could have got away with one. <laughs> now, once again this week, the Aotearoa Rugby Pod is brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped.com to get all of your personal grooming needs for downstairs. The Lawnmower 3.0 is the one to go for to make sure that you have beautiful balls, Jiffer. Oh, yeah. Smooth. <laughs> Very smooth balls. Smooth pulse. and shiny. It's what we all want, let's face it. So we obviously got into action last week with Bryn um, getting his new Manscaped product. You went off to Queenstown. Mm. You make good use of the cleaners at the hotel, you know, leave the mess and, and clean up completely. Well, I actually did it um, before, after our podcast, actually. So <laughs> I uh, went back home. And thankfully, my mother didn't actually clean up. I did it myself, fortunately. Uh, but I was going to tell you what, it was supposed to set me up really, really well for Queenstown, being able to get a little bit more rotation downstairs, but 
you know, I was terrible down south. I was terrible down south of the golfing uh, department, so maybe I needed a little bit more care around that area. But no, it looked good, though. We've sorted it. That's great. The lawnmower has sorted it. Yeah. Yeah, and you can get your peak hygiene plan as well. If you sign up, every three months you get sent the appropriate blades and the appropriate hygiene equipment. And if you go to manscaped.com slash rugby, you'll get 20% off using that code, uh, manscaped.com slash rugby, and then you won't have to worry about that shipping, 20% off. The Lions Tour is other good news from this week. Yes, well. Who, no one thought this was going to happen in South Africa. It wasn't going to happen in South Africa. Now we got it, and it's great. Yeah, well, it's, I think it's exciting for... Um, well, I think it's exciting to see the World Champions, first and foremost. It's been a mm. while since the World Cup final, and um, I think for their playing base, um, and, I mean, what a way to start. Win a World Cup final, and then your first test match back is to play the Lions. I mean, as we all know, as players and as fans, there's no better to... Um, and, you know, there was options to go to Aussie and, um, you know, maybe play it in the UK or whatever. But if they can pull it off and, and play it in, in South Africa, mm. um, oh, I mean, it will be awesome. Whether there's crowds, I don't think there is crowds at this stage. Or, yeah, yeah, I don't think so. But um, it's really exciting for the South African team and, and for the Lions team as well. What do you do here, Bryn? You've barely played test football. In fact, you haven't played test football in a year or so. Um, you've got a warm-up game against the USA, which you know is, is a nice enough warm-up, but not exactly a stiff challenge in comparison to the players coming into the Lions team who've played in a really brutal and really entertaining Six Nations. If you're South Africa, are you on the back foot here? I think preparation-wise, that might be the case. It's, quite, it's pretty similar to what the Lions have to go through. That kind of they all come together. Uh, they don't play a lot of rugby, test rugby together, so. It actually might be a little bit of an equaliser. And I think, you know, don't forget that it's at altitude as well. Um, so it's always tougher to play in South Africa with a bit of altitude. And look, they'll be that hungry to, to prove themselves again. You know, they're the world champions. They haven't played a lot of test match. So if you're talking around guys that are just wanting to have an opportunity to play for their country, um, you know, South Africa will be that excited about it. And if you look around, we talk around lack of preparation. We took a look at Argentina last year in the um, like a championship where you know, they didn't have a lot of preparation even though they, they did have a few warm-up games where they weren't playing a lot of rugby and they always to come in and then you know they ended up having one of the better performance against the All Blacks so I think preparation inside it they might have a little they'll be a little bit underdone there but you know it's no different to what the British Irish Alliance have to do as well you know they they came from all different nations and come together so um, excitement and probably um, not playing a lot of test matches and putting on the South African um, emblem will motivate a lot of guys uh, but at the same time, it is, it is at home. It's in, in home conditions. And we all know, mate, how hard it is to play oh, in South Africa. I reckon it's a masterstroke because they can just, there's no expectation. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the expectation is the Lions will turn up and win because they've had no preparation and they'll play on that. They'll send out, oh, you know, we're underdone. And then they'll just come out on that first test. And, and you know, people, if they lose, then they've gone to the, you know the the I suppose the the ad that you know that they're underdone. If they win, well, you know that's they've exceeded the expectation. Everyone's excited, and and then the series is on. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And, and they've got that first sort of taste, and the adrenaline's running. And I and I you know like Bryn said with RG, I, I think there'll be that much excitement, that much adrenaline. I just don't see, especially the South Africans like representing their country and, and their people and what it means it's, it's so much bigger than than the game mm. you know like it'll be uh, they'll, they'll they'll be all business they'll, they'll get the job job done like I don't know if they'll win the series but they, they'll put on a, a, a pretty big shift and just expanding on Bryn's point the South Africans are used to coming from far and wide aren't they you know the clerks over here and Billy LaRue's in Japan and, you know, they're from all around the place. So they're mm. kind of used to being in that predicament where they don't come in like the All Blacks do for little camps in the middle of Super Rugby. Yeah, and also I think they've they've obviously learnt a lot, the way they built towards the World Cup and the way they bonded and, and the way they structured and, and I suppose their mindsets and the way uh, Rassi Erasmus sort of built their psyche around that and, and, and I'm sure he'll have a bit to do in the planning and, and how they'll prepare and, and you know build towards this will be will be similar or uh, no different. So I, I think they'll be well planned and prepped and, and, and ready to go to make sure that they make their country proud. Yeah. 
The other big question for me is who plays at 10 for this Lions? Oh, it has to be Finn Russell. It's Finn Russell. Yeah, uh, Farrell at 12. Yeah, George Ford hasn't been good enough this year to really warrant a selection. Oh, it's not that he hasn't been good enough. It's just yeah. Finn Russell, mate. He's I, he's just one of those players that I just think he can just do special things. You know, you, you almost, you just, uh, he's just, he's a creator. And, and I think with, um, you know, Farrell outside him as, as a settler, it's, I just think it would be a good, really neat combination to see. And then maybe if you have Ford in the squad, if it doesn't work, at least you can... You, you can revert to something you know that does work. The, the crucial thing is, 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 I suppose, what works for Warren Gatlin's style because he's going to coach a certain way. Does Finn Russell fit into that style? I don't know. So that's what they'll have to work out as a, as a coaching group. You know, it's all well and good me sitting here going, geez, I've just watched Scotland on the weekend beat France and he was great to watch and he just throws everything at it and he's pretty... He's pretty happy-go-lucky guy. Even when he got a red card, <laughs> yeah. he was just like, "Yeah, see you guys." Like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, he was just like, "Sorry," you know, gives an elbow to the throat and just pretty relaxed sort of customer. Um, and you know, you sort of just get the vibe. He's pretty, you know, he's not going to die of an ulcer sort of thing. So, you know, he he might bring a nice vibe to to the, to the team. So, is that going to fit? With the Warren Gatlin style, I don't know. So they'll have to come up with that. It might not, you know, it might be a six and might go back to the uh, tried and true. Dan Biggers performed pretty well for the Welsh side as well. So there's more people in that selection mix mm. than just those three. Um, but, you know, going on current form, um, you know, those guys are in the mix. A couple of young players as well. Those two um, Welsh wingers have to be in there. Adams yeah. and... Um, Rhys Zammett. Yeah, Zammett. Um, yeah, Reece Samet, um, and Van, Van der Merv from Scotland. Yeah. Any guy that comes in and joins a pick and go from a collapse mall and scores a try has to be in the mix for a Lions tour. <laughs> I tell you what, he was just in the thick of it and gets a pick and go try off the back of the Ford's grit. I love that. Um, who else have I got down here? Um, oh, there was there was sort of talk, this Sam Simmons. I don't know if you guys have picked up on this, but there's a lot of chat for him to make the English side. There's a lot of talk that potentially he gets picked in the Lions squad. He's playing that well in the Premiership. So that, I mean, that would be a pretty big feat to not be able to make England and then, then pick, be picked in the Lions. And that's kind of a tradition in the Lions, isn't it, Bryn? We often see a person who's a bit of a bolter that wouldn't be selected by the national coach and makes it into the Lions and then plays a big role. I think when they came down here, the English hooker, um, stop Jamie George. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, he jumped past his national captain That's and right. started yeah, for the yeah. Lions. I think also um, CJ Stander would be a great selection, you know, retiring, go out, like he's got plenty to pay, play for. Um, you know, he'd be, he'd be awesome. Um, so there's a couple of cool selections. I think George North has really reinvented himself at centre. He's had a great Six Nations. Um, I think probably um, Alan Wynne Jones has probably put himself a, a, right in the mix of a skipper. Warren Gatlin knows him really well, had him as his skipper, um, you know, or Ken Owens is there as well. He's probably one of the form hookers, you know. Um, Mara Toji has been talked about, and maybe it's best to just let him be a beast in the second row. So there's, I mean, there's, there's selection, they've got enough there. Yeah. Um, they've, they've got a, plenty of guys in form. Um, you know, and and there, there's a, there's a little bit of fresh talent as well to put in there to spice things up. It's it, but again, it goes back to um, what works for Gatlin and his style um, is is crucial as well. Mm. I think yeah, that's going to be the, the biggest question, Jim, um, around what's the style that Warren wants to play. You know, traditionally he's been based around like winning that halfway battle line, um, a little bit more conservative and been able to put back your defence. You know, you look at that British Irish line, so when they came here, you know, Aaron, Andy Farrell was in there and the messaging that he was giving around them being the world's best, wanting to be the world's best, put these guys under pressure. So traditionally, Warren Gatlin is, is based around that. Um, again, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, the thing with, with Warren, he's pretty low around what he wants and the players that he's that have proven. Uh, at the same time, you know, I'm glad you brought up Finn Russell, Jeff, yeah. I think for a guy that's uh, warranted on form, you know, he's probably the form 10 in that British and Irish Lions uh, makeup. But again, does he fit into what Warren wants? And a lot of these other players that you know we've talked about, does it fit into the idea of what he wants to play? Again, you know, South African conditions could be a little bit different. It won't be as wet, uh, possibly. I'm um, just thinking our time. It won't be as wet when you're when you're there. So it'll be a lot more drier. Um, so then I guess 
the change of style, do they play a, a Northern Hemisphere kind of style based around their defense, or are they just going to open up a little bit, you know, get Finn Russell for one of those test matches because he's, you know, a little bit more of a, of a runner and a bit more elusive than if Johnny Sexton. So um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how Warren goes because you know, there's kind of decisions around how they're going to play. It's going to be pretty, pretty pivotal yeah, around that do you think, you know, you, you're probably going to have to pick a balanced squad so you have the ability to go both ways maybe because you don't know mm. what yeah. conditions you're going to face. Um, yeah, I mean, it's exciting because there's a lot of new faces that have, that have come up during the Six Nations because I've really enjoyed the Six Nations. It's, it's been the tightest and most exciting for a long time. Um, and, you know, obviously... A few few players that have just maybe been a bit out of form, but they've got enough runs on the boards to still warrant selection. Um, but then guys that have played themselves into that selection contention, so um, I'm sure he's got a few tough decisions ahead of him as well. And also to go along with Warren Gatland, a bunch of players who've been to New Zealand and almost done it and learned about how to best conduct themselves on a Lions tour. Mm. That it's a team full of a base of experience. Alan Wynne Jones, Maro Toje, yeah. you know, all these guys. Owen Farrell. They were core within the group that almost did it here. And I still think you'll have all those guys there, but I, I think there's got to be room for some of these young fellows. And that, that, some of them, the skill set is pretty exciting to watch. Like some of the like. I hate to keep going back to those Welsh wingers, but they are good to watch, mate. They yeah. are good to watch. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, if you want to piss off Warren Gatland, tell him that he coaches conservatively. I've made that mistake. It didn't work out I feel like well. Bryn just did. <laughs> he will insist that he coaches for the Bryn, you won't be welcome back at YH any time soon, mate. Do not say <laughs> Warren Ball. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he insists that he can, you know, horses for courses. He can. Make That's what I mean. But I, I think he can as well. I do genuinely think he does have that side to his game as well. And I think you you will have to, especially like Bryn said in the high valley, and, and depending what time the kickoff is as well. Like I, I don't know what time the kickoffs work for, uh, what TV audiences, you know, whatever the broadcast deal is. You know, if it's those mid afternoon and it, and she's hot. You know, it, you'll have to have a brand of footy that that has a you know a different style to just tactical kicking, and 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 he does have that in it. Like, I mean, you've had him in the barbars, Bryn. You'd know more. You you. I mean, you've had him as our coach. Yeah, no, it is. It's, it's those points. You know, it's been able to you know for that barbars. That's a perfect example around that. You know, you just want to throw the ball, but I think he's definitely um, defensively. A, defensive is a massive massive thing for him and. I think, and especially test, especially, especially test matches like that, um, defense is massive. We're talking about an attack, and I think the longer the, the tours go on, that's when you see the, the better the British Irish alliance get. You talk around um, probably the last two to three, the last two and three test matches that New Zealand, they actually had a lot of um, attacking ability. I look at uh, Lee, was it Liam Williams? Yeah. Well, back, yeah, like his injection, and, and you know they talked around um, his attacking ability. So, I think the timing. And the more time they're going to spend together, you are right, Jip. They have actually, you know, the same a lot of the same core players. But it's just going to be that influx of new players that are going to they're going to come in. But they've got that ability. Mm. Looking around their skill set, what it was probably a decade ago, it's part it's par with the All Blacks around you know their skill set of their forwards and their outside backs making. They've been a triple threat with the run kick pass. So Ooh. the skill set's going to be there. And it's a long way since the last decade. So they've definitely got the both both sides around there. They had attacking style um, and obviously the set piece and going through the, the forwards and then have more of a kick and So they've got both sides to it. Yeah. Well, that's what the Reese Samet and, and um, Adams bring, like that short chip and chase, like bringing it back the glory days like Goldie. <laughs> chip and chase game. Um, Finn Russell's got that, that attack and kicking game. Stuart Hogg. Um, yeah, Stuart Hogg. You know, they, they've, they've, you know they, they are playing in more, um, I suppose, you know, not wet conditions at the moment, but that's still, that attack and kicking game still... Warrant in, in dry conditions as well, so um, oh, it's just great that it's on. Yeah. You know, I think it's great that the tour's going ahead. Yeah, we mentioned Finn Russell. Steve Red. Yeah, yeah, the travelling. I mean, it probably won't be there, will it? The nah, it won't be. It won't be. But they'll, they they might um, innovate. You know, we've seen um, what is it? Electronic crowds. You know, you never know. <laughs> yeah. you might come up with something. 
Yeah, yeah, that's really difficult for them, eh? Because I remember going to all of those tests in the last series, and you know we tried to get uh, Tuteramai going, but really, when there's twenty thousand of them going, it is just incredible. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to make a massive difference to the way they lift themselves. It'll be a massive. It'll be massive around the home. You talk around home advantages and test matches. Jeffrey, you know how hard it is to go to South Africa around how um, one, not one eye, but yeah. they support them very, very, Parochial. Them very, very well. Parochial. Yeah, great. Yeah. So don't underestimate that advantage, you know. It's, it's tough to be able to go to South Africa or any home um, touring side. When you're not having that ability to have people in front of you, it just adds that a little bit more um, de stress in you, not being able to have those fans get you home. You know how, how, hard it, how great it is when you're, you're off. You've got your tails up and the crowd's behind you. It just adds you a little bit more, especially in South Africa. Um, they do that very, very well. Well, so, uh, let, um, let's look at um, the Six Nations, for example. Scotland winning in Paris. Uh, yeah. Scotland winning in Twickenham. Mm. Wales, Wales winning at Twickenham. You know, like without the crowd, like some, I'm not saying that's why, yeah, but it, it, does, it does play a, a factor. So I think um, it definitely is part of the atmosphere that takes away. Um, and, and you certainly... Um, Let's put it this way: get a few home truths in the warm-up uh, in South Africa. <laughs> yeah, 100. Well, the ref has a few home truths too. Yeah, and yeah, I think no we doubt. Saw during the Lions series that there were a couple of calls, especially the very last one from that kickoff um, at Eden Park, where the ref was affected by the the crowd going up. Yeah, well, the, the accidental offside or yeah, uh, the scrum knock on. <laughs> Let it go. I wonder if there'll be home refs, um, South African refs, been in South Africa, or whether they'll just fly. They might have the a. MCU they refs. might have a um, a team. A team like they did last because year. Because I suppose if, if the British and Irish lines can travel, I'm sure refs can travel as well. Get them into the bubble and run them for the entire time. Yeah, um, I mean that would be a. I'd, I'd say if you're a referee, that would be a job you'd want. You'd be putting your hand up for, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of Kiwi refs, I'm sure, would love to get into yeah. that. Yeah, Be Ben O'Keefe, yeah. get them on. <laughs> a couple of months in South Africa. Now, let's go back to that uh, France-Scotland game. Um, Finn Russell off, Stuart Hogg off, you know, two of their best players off, and they managed to push through and push through and push through. And yeah, France bottled it, but... You know, they got the win in front. Good patience. 21 yeah. phases to, to get the try. And, uh, yeah, they bottled it. But it, Scotland probably did a little bit too. They did have dominance for, for the most part and, and let the, I suppose, let the French back in uh, in the second half. But then fought their, sort of fought their way back in um, to, to get ahead. And then, and then, obviously, the French got ahead just before... Um, the red card, and then the red card happened, and you sort of thought, oh, well, that's it, that's it done. Um, and then just through grit and determination, managed to get it done. But it was, it was, a, it was, a, great, it was a great game to watch. Mm. It, was, it was a great spectacle, just similar to the Welsh-French game from the week before. You, you know, you sort of thought, well, I, I went into both games assuming the French were going to win, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, and, you know, w was surprised... Um, you know, by the Welsh performance, and and to be honest, with the final result, like I was so surprised that the French came back to win that game, and then on this one, I was so surprised that the Scots came back to win this one. So both both weeks, you know, you're on the edge of your seat on a, and how convenient is the kickoff time on a Saturday morning? <laughs> I might add, um, you know, so no, it was, it was it was a great way to finish a tournament that was so tightly contested, and and I think. Um, it was Scotland's best finish in a number of years, I think. Uh, you know, so they actually had plenty to play for. You know, they, a lot of people were talking about, oh, can Scots do the Welsh a favour, rah, rah, rah. But actually they were doing themselves a favour to, to finish second. I think they ended up finishing second or um, third or something like that. Um, I remember the commentators saying this is the best finish they've had in a number of years if they can get a result. So for them, that was, that was huge. Yeah, yeah. It was incredible, really that they can turn around, because we don't think much about the Scottish, ever. No one really talks about them. And no. they hardly ever get those boil overs. I think they will now, and I think that's what a character like Finn Russell does, because he is so much of a, a maverick as such. You, you, he, can, he can do things so unexpected, 
that you you it's not a it's not a predictable game plan. You can't predict what a Scot you can see a Scotland team name with Finn Russell, and you you've, you've got to be on the edge of your seat because he can pull things off that um, other players just can't. Mm. And with a Stuart Hogg there, who we know is exceptional, but you add the two together, and a, and a forward pack that will just go to the death, you know, every week, um, with with a pretty solid set piece. The the they're, they're, they're going really well. Just on that, Jeff, how do you, because obviously in probably previous lines to as the Scottish players probably haven't you know, been rewarded with the selection. Obviously, we've been so successful and having some great wins this year. Are there any ones that you think have probably warranted you know, a Lions call, apart from Finn Russell and Stuart Hogg? Oh, that Vandermeer, the, the winger. Um, Hamish Watson? Is he close? Potentially, but it's such a congested position like the forwards is a hard one like there's just so many like it's, it's just that's a hard lines pack to break into you know with the English and, and the Welsh players going so well and um, you know with a few Irish stalwarts around it, it'll be a tough maybe maybe I, I don't know it's not a shoe in but like I think I think um, Vander I think it's Vandermeer 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 yeah. yeah. Um, it's a real Scots name. Um, um, I think he he potentially has played himself in. I make a joke about him going and doing that pick and go try, but he wants to be involved. And I think a player with that attitude that wants to have the ball in his hand, and you're a winger, you know, you know, defensively he's always going to be active when he's got that attitude, and then you know. He's always going to be a body in motion that is going to attract defenders. So if he doesn't get the ball, he's still going to hold someone that might create an opportunity for someone else. So I just think anyone with that sort of attitude, you want in a squad. Because even if he's not picked, he's going to be a great squad member. Um, so that's just my take on it. I don't know the guy, just from watching him. Yeah, yeah. Bryn, what about the French? I mean, it sounds counterintuitive. But I wonder whether losing that game is the best possible thing for them, looking forward a couple of years. A bunch of young guys who've got a lot of talent and have you know, come a long way. They didn't win when everyone thought they should. And, and now looking forward, they need to learn that kind of lesson going to a World Cup. Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, they had an opportunity to win that game. So I think any test match you're playing in, it doesn't matter who you play for, you want to be winning test matches. But yeah, I think you can, you can just take a lot of confidence from from what we've seen from them. Um, it's been obviously, it's a young squad, a young side that have come through, a lot of them have come through the under-20s program that was successful a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, bigger picture-wise, 2023 is the goal for them, especially being in France. But, um, you know, I think personally, as a team, it would have been nice for them to get that win um, to sign off a pretty successful Six Nation campaign, especially their one previously with Wales that last that effort to win that game. It would have been nice for them to finish off the season well. Uh, but, We've talked about a lot the way they're playing their rugby at the moment. The flair, um, it's back. We've talked around the new initiative around their attacking style. Um, we're massive. I'm a massive fan of the pull. Um, he's massive. Um, he's been great. So, yeah, they would have loved to win that game. But I think going forward, we've talked about a lot. They're 2023. They're a the progression is going up by that. So, um, they'll continue to learn and um, they'll be better, better for next year in the Six Nations competition. I'm with you. Mm. I reckon it's a good loss. Yeah. I think it um, doesn't uh, hide over the cracks. I think sometimes when you lose like that, if they'd won and won the Six Nations, maybe they just think, oh, you know, we're, we're building and we are just going on that trajectory and it might just happen. Whereas they lose at home, um, they start, maybe they just have a little bit of a harder look and go, we're not quite there yet. We've got a little bit more to learn. And that means they're going to take that attitude into 2022. And I think they'll be even a more dangerous beast going into that 2023. I, I think I think they I think it's a, a good thing for them as a group, and I and I think it will help them progress and learn a lot about because you've got to win seven games to win a World Cup. So it, it teaches them about how disciplined and structured and how hard it is to be on that winning streak run and, and what what goes into. Uh, pulling that off right to the very end yeah right yeah. To, right till the 80th and, and there is no opposition you can just go this is going to happen yeah at international level there is no opposition you can go this is just going to happen 
The thing I think I like about the French setup right now is the consistency of selection. In the past, they'd lose a game like this and they would just be wholesale changes. But you get the feeling that they know they're building something and they've got to push through this. Yeah, and I think there's a good, um, I suppose, cohesive nature between player leadership and management, which maybe in the past has been, um, I don't know, I, I'm guessing, is, is maybe just being a disconnect maybe, I don't know, but it looks like they're just all singing off the same song sheet and, and working together and again that's why I think they might review the game and go what can we take out of this and why Why did we slip off after, because it wasn't a great performance that by their standards against Wales either, I know Wales are a great side but even like their defence was, was passive compared to past weeks uh, when they were you know, emotive and especially after um, a late loss to England. Like, let's not forget the loss to England, and then you know they just won against Wales, and then now they've just um, lost to Scotland. Do you know what I mean? Like, this, we are confident about them, but to win a World Cup, you have to win seven games against teams that are peaking. You know, they'll be peaking, but she's a big beast. So th th I think it's a good position. They're in a great position, and they've got the quality. But there's a lot of work to do before 2023 as well. Okay, let's bring this back full circle to the tipping comp. <laughs> Bryn Hall still out the front. Not many points for any of us on the weekend. <laughs> what do I get? What, what? One Ross? One one point. Oh, she doesn't even have time to check it yeah. in Queenstown. <laughs> no. Mate, have you gone to work today? Have you been back in? We did, mate. She's roaring down here in Christchurch at the moment. She's hot. So we had a, um, had a tough session today. So we are back into it. But yeah. This week we've got the Crusaders versus the Highlanders. Where are you going, Jopper? Crusaders. Crusaders? Yeah, at home. Simple. Fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Points? What's what's kickoff time? Uh, 7 o'clock, I think. Friday night. Friday night, 12. 12 points. Oh, I, look, I'll, look, can I come back to you on yeah. that? Okay, have a think. It's so early in the week. Yeah, I, I feel like I get like I need to actually put a bit more thought into this because I just I just say it now, and then I just forget about it, and then it comes to like old mate changing his calls on Thursday, <laughs> and then coming and going. Oh yeah, I changed them, and, and yeah, so I'll just say Crusaders at this stage. I'll, I'll come back to you on the points. Do we better go, bother going to him on this game? Oh, he's Crusaders. Yeah. Crusaders. It's yeah. Crusaders. Blues, Canes, Bryn. Oh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Blues. Yeah, it's really, I'm not going to not too sure what the score is going to be. But, it's definitely um, changing that a few times. <laughs> that's, there's no guarantee that that's going to be set in stone. It's tough because you know the the, the lineup of you know someone could get injured or um, the team name could obviously add a little spin to the works. But look, I think it's going to be a great game because the Hurricanes are in a bit of a rich reign of form, um, switching in their result on the weekend, and a Blues team that probably um, needs to rectify a few things and get back in the winner's circle. So. Where's that game being played? Eden Park, mate. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go Blues. Easy. Just like that. Ten I'm, points? I'm Blues. Uh, how many points? <sighs> I think it's going to be pretty close, actually. I'm going to go six. Six points. I think what I liked is that there's been a couple of games recently. There appeared like it could be a blowout competition, but like that Chiefs game showed that there's, there's still a little bit in there. there. There's plenty in there. Yeah. For second to get into that final. Um, blues for you, obviously. Yeah. By how many and why? Uh, I'm going to go Blues eight. Yeah. And back at home, looking to replicate that Highlanders clinical performance, set piece, simple footy, front football, carry hard, <laughs> clean hard, great decision making, territory battle. Score points, defend well. Yeah. That's what you said. Done. That was such a <laughs> job done. Are they going to play that speech in the lead up to the game to the teams? Probably not. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> I would, I'd say Leon would give something a lot more passionate than that. <laughs> I can see you with the any given Sunday inch at a time speech. Mm, oh, it's six inches in front of your face. All right, well, that is us for the week again. Uh, thank you to Bryn Hall down in Christchurch, James Parsons here in the Auckland studio. Make sure you tune in this weekend, Sky Super Rugby, on both rugbypass.com around the world and Sky Sport here in New Zealand. It'll be another great weekend of action.